to show you about some of the new features in Rails 5.0 and just some of the different things that I've noticed looking at the change logs. This was definitely a big release, and I think that there's a lot of great things that they have added. So to get started, you can type gem install rails, and then followed by dash dash pre, and this is going to fetch the latest beta version. You can then type rails dash dash version to see the latest version that you have installed. And from here, we can type rails new and then create our test app. If you do need to create an older version, for example, if you want to install version 5.0.1 instead, you are able to do something like this, where you put in the version number with the underscores around it. However, in our case, we want to look at some of the new features in Rails 5.1.0, so we're just going to type Rails new test app. And once that's installed, we can change our directory to our new test app folder. One of the big points in this release is the ability to manage your JavaScript dependencies with Yarn. To install Yarn, you can check out Yarn, and you'll see that you can just run brew install Yarn, and this will install the latest version available. Or if you're on Linux, they have the necessary steps here as well. So I'm going to go ahead and type brew install Yarn, and then Yarn should install, and then I'll be able to use Yarn within my Rails application. And in this new release, they've also made using Webpack extremely easy within your application. So I'm going to go ahead and just destroy this test app, and I'm going to create another test app, but this time I'm going to pass in dash dash Webpack. And this will automatically install Webpack within the application once it's created. If you have a Rails 5.1 application, if you want to install Webpack afterwards, you are able to then call Webpacker and then install. And also, if you want to use something like Vue, Angular, or React, you can also have Yarn and Webpacker manage this for you automatically. So if we call Rails Generate Webpacker Install, then we pass in Vue, it'll install the Vue libraries, or you could call Angular or React. On a new application, you can call Rails New Test App Webpack, and then equals Vue. And keep in mind that when you go to deploy your application to a production environment, we're familiar with the Rails assets pre-compile, but then they also have now the Rails Webpacker compile. So now let's say we want to add a JavaScript library into our application. So for example, we can call yarn add and then full calendar, and this will automatically add and install full calendar into our application. So within our new application under the app folder, you'll now see that we have this JavaScript folder. And in this folder, we have packs. And then there's that application.js file. And within this file, this was a console.log, but I'm just changing it to an alert. And from here, I'll just copy this JavaScript pack tag, and then we'll add this into our layouts. So within our layouts, under the view layouts application.rb, I'll simply just add the JavaScript pack tag. And off camera, I created a new controller called welcome and a action called index. And I set this to our root path so it'll pick up the application layout. Starting up our Rails application and then loading it in the browser, you'll see that now we have our welcome index. However, we don't see that JavaScript alert from our webpack. If we inspect the elements, you'll see that it failed to load the resource application.js. And this is referring to the application.js file under the packs directory. So even though we have our Rails server running on one terminal, we'll need to open up another terminal, and then we'll need to run the Webpack dev server under the bin folder in the root of our Rails application. You'll then need to come under config, environments, development, and then uncomment this third line. And this is just going to point to in reference to the Webpack dev server. And then be sure to come back and restart your Rails application to pick up that new configuration. Coming back to our Rails application, we should be able to refresh the page, and now you see the alert message. And one of the real cool things about Webpacker is if we change some stuff in our Webpacker folders, then if we save it, you'll see that it automatically runs the JavaScript. Another big change within Rails 5.1.0 is that it dropped jQuery as a default dependency. They've rewritten the Rails UJS library in vanilla JavaScript. So now if you don't have any third-party dependencies requiring on jQuery, you don't even need to add this into your Rails assets. Another new great feature is system tests baked right into the Rails core. So to get started, I'll go ahead and install the Chrome driver. And next, I'm going to generate a new test. And we can do this with Rails generate system test. And then I'm going to call my test the welcome controller. You'll see that it creates a new file. If we open up this file, 
you'll see that now it requires this application system test case and it inherits from the application system test case. If we go into our test folder and then click on application system test case, you'll see that we're using Selenium and then the Chrome driver and it targets a screen size of 1400 1400. So I'm going to just go ahead and create a simple test and this is just called visiting the index where we visit our root URL and then we're going to accept the alert webpacker and this is just the JavaScript alert that's fired by our webpacker application JS file and then we're just going to make sure that we have an h1 element tag that contains the word welcome. And then we can come back to our application root and call rake test and it's going to run all the unit tests as well as the new system tests. And then you'll see that it automatically shows that it got our welcome index but then the test failed because it was unable to find the model dialog with webpacker. And I've not played around with webpacker and system tests too much yet but I did find that in the environments test.rb file also set the dev server host so the webpacker dev server we'll be able to serve the assets and the test will complete. And then back in our console, if we run rake test, it'll then run all the unit tests and the system tests, and then you'll see that everything pass. And another new feature is Rails Secrets. And this function is very similar to Ansible Vault, where you can create a secrets file, commit it to your code repository, and it'll be encrypted. So if you run Rails Secrets setup, you'll see that it runs a bunch of stuff, but the main things we need to see is that it creates this config, secrets.yaml.key file. It adds the key file to our git ignore because this key file is going to be super secret. So you don't want to share it with anyone because this is going to be the key that decrypts your encrypted yaml file. So you want to be able to store this in whatever kind of password manager that you share out with your team. And then finally it creates this config secrets yaml encrypted file. And to edit this file, we can run rail secrets edit. And this will use a editor based on the environment variable editor. So if you set your editor to VI or nano, then this is going to be the editor used when you run Rails secrets edit. So if we run Rails secrets edit, you'll see that it'll load up my nano file. And from here, we can just add in any secrets that we need to. And it follows and works well with the existing secrets YAML file. Meaning that if we have this production key, and then below it nested, we have this external API key. This production key is not going to conflict with our existing secrets file, but it's just going to add in the additional keys. As soon as you close and save the file, it'll automatically save and re-encrypt the file, and it'll delete that temporary file that it was using. And another exciting feature is the action mailer default parameters. So let's say if you have a invitations mailer, where you have account invitation, and then you have a couple of parameters. This is how you would set your instance variables to then be able to use in your mailer and then also the mailer views. Same with the project invitation, accepts another list of parameters. So with the new default parameters, you're able to do something like this now where you have a before action and then you set in the different parameters. So this way, all of these similar account invitation, project invitation that share these instant variables we can dry it up and it's much more clean now. You'll see with the project invitation, it is just calling at project is equal to the parameters project because this is not a common parameter that's found with all the other different mailer actions. So I'll post into the show notes, but there's been a lot of deprecated features that have been removed. So render nothing no longer works and render text no longer works and say you would want to use plain in this case. And then also the redirect to the browser back is no longer supported. And within action support, there's also been a whole bunch of deprecated features removed. And you'll definitely want to check out all the different change logs because there's going to be a lot of methods that are removed that could cause a breaking change within your application if you upgrade to Rails 5.1.0. So there's been a lot of new features added into Rails 5 that just may be taken for granted. One of the big ones is changing the ERB handler from eRubis to eRuby. eRuby is a much smaller, lighter weight, as well as a maintained version. So to me, one of the coolest features that's been added into the action view is just cleaning up the log file. So historically, when you rendered a message, it would then display a bunch of text with the message key. If it was a hit or a miss, it would have shown a big long text for the key. And then it shows if it's cash hit or miss. So I really didn't like that because it really muddied up my logs and I didn't really ever even rely on those. But now it's just very clean and much smaller. 
and you are still able to configure this within your initializer. And another big feature is the form width. So as an alternative to form4 and form tag, you now have this helper method form width. And it works something like this, where you can pass form width, and then pass the model at post. It'll set the scope to post, and it'll also set the URL to the post. And with something like a form tag, you are still able to do this with form width, just passing in a URL if you have a class something and an ID of something. Another really cool feature that was added is the virtual or generated column support in MySQL and MariaDB. And this is where you basically have an existing attribute, and then you want to create a virtual column that's not necessarily information supplied by the user, but based on other columns, you're then creating a virtual or generated column with other data. So in this example, they just have a upper name, and then they pass in the function upper and then the name. And then they have the name length, and they're storing this as an integer type, and they just get the length of the name string. So this is going to be a really cool feature, especially if you have some complex calculations, you could do it on the SQL side, have that information stored, and then be able to access it within your Rails application. And then another more future-proofing feature is with the Postgres and MySQL, using a big integer as a primary key for new tables. And if your application doesn't grow really big or something, then you may not see the benefit in this. However, if you are seeing where you're getting millions and millions of records a day, then this could become quite a handy feature. So there are so many more features than what I had time to cover today. However, have a look at the blog post to see some of the other features added into the various components of the Rails application. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.